Greg, thank you for taking the time to show us some of your skills around the green. Would it be fair to say, if I had to think of a reason why you've been so successful throughout your career, this is your biggest strength? Yeah, short game would be, and statistically, bunkers is the best part of my game. Well, let's not waste time, let's get in there. <laughs> I'm putting myself up to it now. Can Which pin just... am I going for? Can you talk us through, really, the basic, the sort of fundamentals, the foundation of bunker play, what it takes for you to be a good bunker player? Uh, pretty simple, you, you know, and you see this, anybody who struggles with bunker play, generally they're trying to lift the ball up and they're backing up onto their right leg. All good bunker players will be sitting on their left side and stay on their left side. Once you're over here, your body is kind of left of the ball, you can then do whatever you want with the club, club head coming through impact. But if you get stuck on this right-hand side, you essentially you can't get at the golf ball at all. So every amateur trying to do it is this way. Whereas if you want to be good out of bunkers, all you do is press yourself into that left side. You can even see my right heel is off the ground. I sit over there and just stay left. Wow. Not bad, ladies and gentlemen. How similar is the shot that we're going to play now? I mean, we're going to play a flop shot. It's the shot that we all seen. We've seen Phil Mickelson do it so well for years. What's the, effectively the difference between this and what you've just done there in the bunker? Well, uh, this is actually quite similar out of rough to what a bunker shot would be. If it was a tight lie, it'd be a little bit different again. But huge amount of determines how the ball is sitting. This is very neutral, so I won't actually lean as much in in this shot because that ball is effectively two inches off the ground. I'll actually sit maybe 50-50. I can sit, sit there underneath it again. Up. Plenty of elevation. Can we now, see it again? So let's say, so let's say that was a half-decent lie. Let's yeah, see one a from, a, from this, a This, from is, a poor this is probably the worst lie you can get where the grass is coming into you. I'm not sure I like the fact that you've given yourself this lie, but yeah. we'll go with it okay. anyway. Grass so going this, towards you is a tough one, isn't it? So you're going to have to hit this a little harder. Oh, what a strike that is. It comes wow. out dead. It's impressive. What, what you will notice there, and this is something, this is a bane of my life when I'm watching the commentators. They'll always say, hit two inches behind the ball. Well, my ball was probably there, and you'll see I've actually hit, you know, four or five inches behind it. But I was trying to hit the golf ball. It's just unavoidable. So the one thing you don't want to try and do is start trying to hit behind it because you'll end up too far behind it. Always try and make contact, but realise that eventually the grass is always going to get in the way. So it's, it looks like you've hit behind it, but you're still trying to hit the golf ball. Don't, don't give yourself that two inches because you'll end up too far behind it. So effectively, how thick that grass is will depend on how much grass you've got to go through yeah. will depend on how fast you have to swing it, it, and how it's Im hard. It's impossible to hit that clean. So it, it, in the end of the day, from experience, if I'm going a little further over there, from experience, I know this is going to catch some grass. Just like so. Such control from such a poor light. Minimum air time, maximum ground time is really the key to success here. But we see a lot of club golfers throwing the ball into the middle of the green because they think, well, it's a short shot, I need to use a sandwich. I use the following example to try and trip them into my way of thinking. I say, well, if you stood here on the edge of the green and I gave you a ball in your hand and said, throw this ball into one of these circles, this one's an open circle, but the other two, and said, throw this ball and land it in one of those circles for a million pound prize, which circle would you choose? Well, clearly, anybody would choose the closest one because it's the easiest task. But that sometimes we don't follow that process one we actually go to chipping. So Andy, let's follow that process now and show the, uh, the viewers that we can actually get the ball to various parts of this green just by landing it on the front. So if I landed the ball in the circle here and wanted to get it to that flag, what club yeah. are you going to use for that? Just like a pitching wedge for me, like uh, just a bit more elevation just because it's going to pitch a little bit further on the green. So for this one, it would just be a pitching wedge for me, just try and land it in okay. there and run it out. So really what we're saying here is don't use a bigger swing and a bigger technique than you actually need. Make the minimal stroke that you possibly can. Andy can make a very short stroke, land the ball in the circle and get it all the way across to that flag on the far side. Now, the greens here are obviously extremely quick at Woburn. At your home club, they wouldn't be as fast as this. So you may have to take a seven iron to land the ball on the front of the green and run it all the way across to the far side. One of the most difficult shots in golf. I'm going to give you a nice lie. Just... Oh, yeah, really? That's lovely, yeah. Just explain for me the techniques that you would go through. Obviously not to this tight flag, to get to the yeah. far flag. Uh, you know, like I say, when you're on a downslope like this, you want to work your body with the slope. So I'd definitely, again, say left-sided more. And that just also creates a better angle for you to work the club back into the ball there to actually get some elevation on it. Obviously, if you were just standing normal to it, again, you could just skull it straight across the green there. So for me, get on your left side there. It creates a little bit more steepness in the backswing that allows you to get it underneath the ball, like Padre was saying, and just play it towards that flag. And it's obviously... 
off this lie, you're not going to get that much spin. It's going to release quite a lot out there because you're just not going to make contact with the ball that much. OK, let's see you demonstrate that one for us. So really swinging down the slope, focused on the weight on the left side. You see how low that ball comes out? That's because, obviously, the way Andy's set up, it's reduced the loft on that club. OK, just quickly, Andy, we'll go and show the one off the upslope as well. So here we've got a, an uphill lie. Explain how you would go about that one. Same thing again, really, just using the slope to your advantage. There. I'd sit into this one, especially if, to this near pin here. I'd definitely sit into this one more on my right side, just working the slope with that. So you're going to get the elevation to stop it quickly. If we're going to the far flag, I may just sit into the slope a little bit and try and dink it out, or even have another club like a sand wedge or a pitching wedge and just try and play the similar shot on the upslope just to play it a little bit further. So. OK, just set up to that one for me. And again, you can see, because of the way Andy's adopted himself to the slope, just look how much loft is now on that club because of the way he's set up to the ball. Very opposite to the way that we saw on the downslope. OK, Andy, go ahead and hit that one for us. Beautifully done.